dunya it is our experience that in this dunya in the world any type of disaster if we take any type of natural disaster that occurs for example we have an earthquake or a flood or a storm or dangerous hurricanes and winds and rainfall torrential rainfall we see these things happening in our lives we hear about these things and from these experiences to save oneself from these a person prepares or is cautious and is aware that may the flood not come so will uh, put up some um, flood defenses or a wall or for earthquakes will design and construct buildings that are earthquake sort of proof uh, or will do other sort of precautionary actions so that we are protected etc etc and the reason for this is that as soon as we hear about an earthquake suddenly we'll think oh in that country an earthquake occurred and we see with our eyes the effects pictures the buildings have fallen down roads have cracked open and electricity has gone people have come to the roads onto the streets people fell into the cracks of the earth and or they got buried under rubble we've seen this with our own eyes the destruction of an earthquake and that's an example of a calamity so our experience makes us alert and aware we have the knowledge of then how to maybe uh, be saved from this in the future. For example, if an earthquake happens, this will happen. If a flood comes, then the crops will die and there will be destruction. We've seen this with our eyes. So we know in the future maybe what to do to minimize the loss. This is experience. This is not information, second-hand information or tertiary information or secondary information. These are things we hear, see, read in the papers. So to protect ourselves, we, we secure ourselves, don't we? For the future potential loss. But this, if we look at this, what we've just discussed that this is um, not, you can say, permanent destruction, because the hereafter uh, destruction and loss, where we will end up, potentially, then there, have we ever thought about the loss and destruction of the hereafter? That one sin, one sin, let's take a minor sin, that we actually call a minor sin, but it's not a minor. What is its situation? its result in the next world when we get to that next world. What will be the reaction or the consequence of that sin? Just like we've seen the reaction of an earthquake, destruction, buildings fall, we get scared, fear, fear. So one sin, now, if we take a sin, what is the disastrous consequence of that one sin? What's the destruction that will be earned through that one sin? What will be the loss through that one sin? What will be the darkness experienced through that one sin? That every human being or, or human beings who, or a human being who considered a sin as very small and minute and then the abode that is earned by that sin and the punishment that will be given and the fire that will be burnt in or kept, a person will be kept in that fire. Then can we think, we cannot even think about the destruction earned through that one sin. Look at this point. Look at this point. So now... What, what do we have to think here? That it's easy, isn't it, to sin? That we're, we're scared of earthquakes, but we're not afraid of sinning or committing a sin. One sin. We are afraid of floods. We'll be scared of typhoons and hurricanes, but we're not afraid of sinning or committing one sin. If we all say this, that oh, we can see this from experience, the results of uh, the, the calamities and human and... Um, uh, earthly destruction but what about the experience of a sin for example if I sin 
in front of others or on my own, then I don't see the effect, do I? I'll say, oh, there's no effect, it's okay. But no, in reality, that when I, we or somebody sins, we have more information about the results of sin than what I see in the world. Why? Because the Prophet of Allah, sallallahu alayhi wa told us the consequences. Based on his experience, he said, if you do this sin, you'll get this punishment. If you do this sin, you'll get this punishment. If you commit this sin, then you'll get this consequence. Okay, But unfortunately, sadly, we do not trust upon the blessed words of the Prophet ﷺ. If we had yaqeen that there's such a big disaster, or the sin is a disaster, and the disastrous consequences, then we would never consider a sin as a minor sin ever again. We'd never imagine that, oh, I'll do a sin and it's okay, nothing will happen. No. Allah Ta'ala has given us an announcement, a big announcement with regards to sinning and the result of sinning. Big announcement. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala called his mahboob, his beloved Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa to the heavens and showed the effects of sins. And Allah mentioned this in the Qur'an. So this is the reality that this was a big journey, spiritual, physical. Rasulullah sallallahu maqam elevated, increased. We see his maqam and we feel and we read and we understand the glorious status of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa But look at the reality of what this journey was for. We, we look at one mi'raj, and we look at the physical journey of the mi'raj. But imagine how many mi'rajes the Prophet ﷺ went through. His whole life, subhanAllah, was a great, great, uh, you can say, result for us. The, the, who can recognize the actual status of the Prophet ﷺ? And who can actually understand the link that the Prophet ﷺ had with Allah? Nobody. So this one mi'raj that we have been told about, who knows? What else is there? And if we start to analyze and look at the reality of this miraj, then the signs and the lessons from this miraj were the same that we've just discussed. The Rasulullah was shown the signs, the results of the sins. And the Prophet ﷺ saw with his own blessed eyes that if a person sins like this, like this, like this, then the physical reaction and consequences of those sins were there for us to see. Isn't this miraj? But nobody comes towards this from the, the lesson of Miraj. And this is the reality that the reason for the journey of Miraj was this. But we don't go towards that. We argue, no, did the Prophet doesn't see with his eyes? Did he not see? Did he go to this status? Did he reach here or not? We talk about spirituality and achievement, debates and arguments and difference of opinion. But we don't look at the reality of the lesson of the witnessing during this journey of Miraj. The hikmah, the wisdom of this journey was that the link connection of this Janu Miraj, the reality of this Janu Miraj was linked to the Ummah, the nation of the Muslimin. And this was the message from the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam that I've seen with my eyes. It's not just wahi that Allah Ta'ala gave, but my eyes saw the results of the sin so that I could ex- exchange that information with you and tell you, educate you, O human beings, what is the result of sin. Just like when a person sees something with his own eyes, that's primary evidence and we protect ourselves. The same way we've got primary evidence of the Prophet we should be saving ourselves. Just like, for example, Rasulullah was on the journey of Mi'raj and he came upon one location. And Jibreel al Islam was with him, the blessed angel, and there, there was a qawm, a nation. This is during the journey of Mi'raj. And the Prophet ﷺ saw a qawm, a nation. And what were those people doing? Or what was happening to those people? And the Prophet ﷺ stopped there. And as a Jibreel is introducing in each stage, each position, this is happening and this is happening and this is happening due to this, etc. So Rasulullah ﷺ saw a people, a group, an ummah or nation. And the hal, their condition was what? What did Rasulullah ﷺ see? That they, and this will happen, my brothers, may Allah forgive, may Allah protect, may Allah protect, may Allah save us. That in hellfire, the figures, the appearance of human beings will be so horrible. Their trees will be as high as Uhud. They'll be sharp. It won't be these faces that we will have the adab on. It will be ugly, disfigured and horrible, scary, scary uh, faces. And people will be big. Their faces may be big so they can see their punishment and feel their punishment. Must consistent, constant, ongoing, never ending. Imagine, imagine, brothers, my friends. So Rasulullah saw qawm that with their own sharp nails, imagine the nails, Allah knows best how long and sharp and big these nails were because we don't know. We don't know. So when a person goes into Jahannam, he can't say, Allah, don't do this to me or change this. No. Nope. End of story. So they were horrible and ugly and sharp, long nails. These people had in hellfire with their own nails. And the face that became in the hellfire, he's scratching and 
tearing his face or her face and blood's coming out and wounds and scars and and alongside that was haram meat on one side and that person's eating the haram meat and lawful me. May Allah forgive. May Allah forgive. May Allah protect. On this journey, Rasulullah saw these consequences. Nabi al Karim sallallahu alayhi wa stopped there and said, Jibreel, who are these people? Who are these people? And then with sadness, Hajar Jibreel said, these are the people from your ummah, not the previous ummahs. This was being shown to the, to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, that these are the people from your ummah. Alas, O Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa Why? Why is this? These are those people that they didn't think sins were anything significant. They never considered a sin as an issue. They thought it was a minor to be ignored. But if they realized that what was the real the reality of one sin, they will take a person to this position, to this maqam, then would the human being not save himself from sin? Isn't it brothers? That me, you, do we know that how quickly this result will be witnessed? And those who have gone, who have already witnessed, for example, let's say that me or you, we pass away. And we're free from this world. Then listen to this hadith. Where will we be? Where will we be? So this, this is the book, the story, the facts of life that should be inscribed on our hearts. That we are passing through a massive deception. Wallahi, we are passing through a massive deception. Those words that are according to the Quran and hadith, if we insert them into our life, that for example, I'm sharing with you this event now. This scene. And if this sin is present in our life, and we do not eliminate that sin from a life, that action that can eliminate the sin, if we don't utilize that to eliminate the sin, and it's not that every sin is eliminated by salah or namaz or tawbah. No, some sins are not even eliminated via tawbah. For example, you can ask for tawbah in Ramadan. You can go to Masjid Nabwi and ask for tawbah. You can go to Multazam and do tawbah. You can go to Maqam Ibrahim and prostrate and do tawbah. But such sins, some sins are not eliminated through this tawbah. They're only eliminated through the action. Allah Ta'ala says, if you do this action, it will eliminate the sin. And that action that will eliminate the sin, it's very simple. Say subhanallah. It's a simple action that can eliminate the sin. But our aqal and mindset is so blinded and illusioned and with such a cloud over it that we don't even realize what will happen in the hereafter. We don't even realize. It's so much of our nafs and desires have wrapped around us. And shaitan, his mission is to deliver us to hellfire. But we are, in, we are enshrouded in our nafs. We don't even commit 1% security to protect us from hellfire. Not through wahi. Not through the tongue. Rather, Rasulullah himself experienced from, he saw his eyes the consequence of this sin. If we realize today, will we save ourselves from this sin or not? Tell me, will we or not? Why? Because if I, you, me, us, if we go to the hereafter with this sin, then what will happen to us on the day of Hashir? What is the shelter, the protection, the refuge from this sin? How can we think that we are free and we're fine and we're pious and we are sinless? What will save me, us, all of us from the punishment of this sin? Our salah is weak. It's idle. I know, I know how many people come to Fajr Salah in the morning. We see this. So this is a big disaster that we're passing through, that we're seeing with our eyes, a person has departed. May Allah Ta'ala forgive that person. But think, what is the condition of that life, that person's life in this world saying to us? That Allah Ta'ala has given us news, exchange the information that this will be the hal of that person. And this will be his consequence if you do it. If you want to be saved, then do this and you'll be saved. Say subhanallah. Say subhanallah. But no, we want to go to Jahannam, hellfire. We, pr- we prefer this consequence, who will tell us uh, when it's too late? If today we cannot save ourselves, today we cannot save ourselves, today we don't want to save ourselves, the Quran is telling us that this is the punishment of this sin. And alongside that, the Quran is telling us that if you want to be saved from this sin, then this is the cure. Should we not implement the cure? Will we or not? Inshallah. Inshallah. Why are our hearts are like rocks nowadays, like stones? And with speed, life is passing away. Youth when childhood when youth when middle age when black hairs when grey hairs have come. The grey hairs have changed to white. We go to hospitals and tablets and medicines and 
and cure those friends of ours, colleagues, father, mother. Everyone has gone, or their lives are passing, and the graveyard is being filled with speed. We stand next to the Janaz. Who was this? This was this person's father, this person's mother, this tribe is from our village, from our locality. That's it. Every day with our hands, we are lowering the, the, the mayats and the deceased into the grave in this mela, in this show. We will also depart this show. The show of the world, what guarantee is there? No, none. That we will live another day? There's no guarantee. Such examples, a person sitting down, suddenly has a pain, what's happened? Oh, himself, he's shocked, I was fine. And where's this pain suddenly come from in my body? And he gets surprised and shocked. That for example, he's getting ready for work, suddenly in his stomach this pain. Oh, where's this pain come from? Then he starts to sit down, he starts to do dua. Then he realizes that uh, for example, he's got stones or there's a defect in the organ. He's going to hospital. He's not going to work. He was ready to go to work. He had the briefcase. He had made his pack lunch in a pack lunch box and put it in the bag to go to work. But off he went to the hospital. So brothers, let's use our aql, intellect. Why are we so immersed in this dunya? Allah says in the Quran, Umraka. I swear by your age, O oh my Habib, Salasam, people are intoxicated with the world. This tomb, they are living in the intoxicated like Lut alayhi salam's nation. And um, they came and angels would come to them and tell them and warn them. But they never listened. They never took heed. They never they never learnt. And just a Lut's nation, Thamud and Nu alayhi salam, and the message would come that you are sinning with the angels, we're telling you. Be careful, save yourselves, and now let's compare ourselves. Tell me, Allah is not saying this is a sin, and I saw the consequence with my own eyes. Should we not leave the sin? And today we don't leave the sin after today. What are we? We're the most unfortunate person in the world now. We are the most unfortunate man or woman if we do not leave this sin after learning about it. What will be our hal in Jahannam? What shelter do I have to save myself from the punishment of this sin? What will save me? What will protect me? The Quran won't save me, no salah, no dhikr, nothing. Nothing. So, he is pulling on his face, scratching, eating haram, meat. Rasulullah sallallahu saw this and was distressed. What's going on here? And Jibreel said, these are the people from your ummah. And this was the face before. Now in Jahannam, their faces are like this. How will they stay? How long for? There's no limit. No end time. No upper limit. So what happened here? What did they do? To get that punishment, what did they do? That what we consider is a very small sin akin to a dot. You know, like a speck of dust. We consider the sin like that. Ah, oh, it's okay. I've just prayed Salah. I prayed the Hajjid in the morning. I'm okay. So this is our Kamal. We look at our piety, so-called. I'm a Hazrat Sahib. I'm a Peer. I'm a Sheikh. I'm a teacher and I get myself big headed and I've got a status. I do ibadah. Oh no, no, he does a lot of hajj. He's done a lot of umrah. He wakes up all night long and he's always fasting, voluntary fasts. This is our status. Is it? Yani shaitan has played such games with us, such games with us that we don't get piety or the nearness to Allah through these actions. No, no, no. This is not the right method. Yes, not even 1%. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Allah says, closest to me is that person who saves himself or herself from disobedience to Allah, who leaves the sins, who Allah ta'ala says, La, that the person, the Allah ta'ala said to the, to, to, uh, that don't go towards this fruit. Yes, that he, shaitan, 600,000 years of the hereafter, he did ibadah, he used to teach the angels, he was the head of the angels. Allah Ta'ala said to him that don't go towards this action. And what are we being told here? Think what Allah Ta'ala has told us that don't do this action, don't do this action, don't do these actions. And in all our homes, all the actions all put together in one go. Allah Akbar. Allah Ta'ala says in this home, the angels will not come. They will not come. And they are hung up in such numbers that forget the angels. We don't care, we say. Yani, the spiritual nation of the angels. And compared to our status that what we can attain, they're nothing. But then Allah Ta'ala says that our hisab, it's, it's mounting our sins. Allah Ta'ala has just given us a chance that maybe before your death, you will attend a gathering of a wali Allah, a wali Allah, a shaykh, and you will get some intellect and understanding. And a person, if he leaves the gathering of wali Allah, lost and he doesn't do tawbah, then the doors are shut on that person. Why? Why? 
Just like Rasulullah's generation, and we had people, the Sahaba and the people who didn't believe Abu Jahal and others rejected, they left and they never had the chance again to carry it today. The deputies, the deputies of the Nabi, of Rasulullah, the ulama, the respected noble uh, scholars and the awliya Allah, and in their majlis, alhamdulillah, a person's destiny can be transformed. And from there, if a person leaves that gathering without any guidance, then there's no way that person's islah can be done after that. Then the doors are shut on that person. The opportunities diminish and disappear. disappear. So the recommended majalis that Allah Ta'ala has given, Alhamdulillah, ulayma haq, the, the, the rightly guided scholars, if a person leaves that gathering and rejects, leaves empty-handed, then there can be no chance after that. Allah Ta'ala says, then I close the doors on that person, I shut the opportunities on that person. They are disappearing. So tell me, that us, me, all of us, for what things has Allah Ta'ala, has, what things has Allah Ta'ala told us to refrain from? And all of those things we do from morning till night. Morning to evening. What action is there that we don't do out of the actions Allah Ta'ala has told us to cease? So how can we be pious by making a good face and wearing the clothes and going to the masjids and having the prostration mark on our foreheads and keep on going to hajj every year and spending money on the ticket to hajj? What difference does it make? The kamal, the achievement is this, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has told us to refrain from some things for our life long. We should not lift our eyelids to look at that sin and go towards it. This is the consequence of that sin. And the person who does this, alhamdulillah, then most qareeb will be that individual who stops those actions, those actions that Allah has told us to leave. And we fall more into a trap. It's okay, I pray salah, I do dhikr, I remember Allah, mashallah, I do work of the deen, I do this, X, Y, Z, I'm forgiven, I'm pious. This is a massive deception. And before, behind us people, they encourage us, they push us. Push us. And they give, they they make a person, they blow him up. Your part, your, your they, they that your your big and your your deeds are big, and your they they blow out of proportion the status of that person. That you're pious, but everyone should look into their hearts. We should stand in front of the mirror, just like me and you. We stand and we comb our hair and we make our beards look presentable. Morning and evening, we look in the mirrors and our faces. We should look at our nafs, our desires, and see that what bad actions is our nafs making us do and how many of Allah's ahkams we disobey morning till evening don't look at your salah I should look at my prayer I should look at the sins that I'm committing and due to the sadqa of leaving sin I'll be accepted our hajj salah and they're not on the rank that they should be so if I leave the world in this way that I have not disobeyed Allah that Allah has ordered me I've not rejected Allah I swear by Allah that even my broken down salah will be accepted and Allah will send us into paradise that's how Allah will be pleased with us Allah is pleased with those things that this is my servant who did not disobey me. And whoever doesn't disobey me, he doesn't disobey me due to one thing. That he didn't disobey me. He has done it due to one reason. That he hasn't disobeyed me. And what is that? That in his heart was the khawf, the fear of Allah, Rabbul Alameen. And this is taqwa. That there was fear in that person's heart and that would prevent him from doing sin. He sacrificed his desires, his enjoyment out of the fear of Allah. Not that everyone does it, so we can do it. Oh, everyone does it, it's alright, we can do it. Everyone does this, this person does this. This everyone he didn't care about. He said, no, not sub, but rabba. Say subhanallah, subhanallah. That he didn't say sub, he didn't say all, he said Allah. Now tell me, has Allah said this or not? Is Allah displeased with this? He is, so then I'm not going to do it. Then I will see which woman complains. No, no, no. In this day and age, how can we do parda? Can we be shielded? Then I'll see that their life, will it come, the coolness, and will the fussiness disappear or not? So these experiences that Rasulullah tell us about this sin, imagine this experience uh, coming back to that incident. Let's take for example, look into your hearts and do marak about two minutes, that me and you, are we committing this sin or not? Shall I tell you, if I tell you the sin, all of us, we need to take our piety, ilm, dhikr, adhkar, we need to bear ourselves naked, look into our hearts and think, I've passed away, is this sin attached to me, is this in my life, and Rasulullah is seeing that this action occurred, and these people were punished due to that action. So, that sin, if I commit that sin, I'll be grabbed, and will I be free? Will I be forgiven? No, the hadith tells us that you and me, we need to look at each other. I need to look at myself in the mirror. That Do I have this in my life if I pass away? As soon as I pass away, and I will get to that maqam that Rasulullah has told me about. I will reach there. And is this a small sin? Is this a minor sin? It's so common today in society. 
the mosques are not safe from this, nor is the Kaaba safe from this, nor is Haram Sharif safe from this, nor is the home, nor is the outside, nor do the Khanka safe from this, nor is Peel Saab safe from this. Nobody is safe from this sin that gives this punishment. Everyone with speed is, is implementing this sin. And what's the punishment? Listen to the punishment. This is experience that's telling us now. As a Kaab, radiyallahu anhu stated, and he's telling us this, that the punishment of this sin will be so severe, the first, that person who committed this sin will be thrown into hellfire. So tell me, those people will sin many other sins. So this sin that we don't even consider as a sin, just within a second, within a minute, even during wudu will do this sin. Wudu. We'll do assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah and we'll commit this sin. And we'll just come into the masjid and we'll commit this sin. وَلَا يَكْتُمْ بَعْدُكُمْ بَعْدَ Allah Ta'ala says, Beware, beware, Allah says, do not backbite against each other. Do not backbite. This is from the Quran. Is this not in the Quran? Hafiz Sahib, in your heart, is this Quran not memorized? Hafiz Sahib, put your, put your head down. Analyze, I read Quran. This verse, how much do I implement this verse? Have I backbited against anybody up to today? Let's look. Really be honest with ourselves. Have I, how much today did I backbite? How many people did I steal from or speak bad about? How many at my home, in my family or outside? Backbiting is that speech which is performed behind the back of a person that if you were to speak in his face, he would not like it. Huh? We call this backbiting. Huh? This is backbiting. You say to me, huh? uh, will I not take it badly if you tell me I'm backbiting? I'll reject it. Look at him, he's saying this, he's like that. You're joking against somebody. Who are you to, 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 to mock that person? Has Abu Hurairah radiallahu anhu narrated a great hadith. He said, what kind of people, what kind of ummah, what has happened to the people that they don't even see the, the twig, their own, their own, the consequences of their sins or their own actions and they look at the defects of other people. In other words, that for example, we'll look at this minutest of particles of sin in another person, but we don't see our massive object of a sin. If somebody sins a mind, oh, we'll jump on him, oh, look at him, he's done this and that, he's done this, but we don't see the big scars of sins on our own accounts of sins, our own record books. Which home, office, tell me, is it where it's morning till evening, there's no backbiting, my brothers, if the punishment of this sin is so massive, the first of all, due to this sin, a person will go into hellfire, forget his salah, fasting, hajj, how will there be peace at home, ibadat, worship, how will his du'as be accepted, tell me, tell me, that I'm talking about one sin here, what life will there be of that person, what mouth, what death, what ibadah will he be doing, what dhikr will that person be doing, what will be the effects of that person's ibadah, nothing, empty, void, think about it, Anyone, any person, me, I am with you, I am with you in, include, involved in this. Can anyone claim in this masjid that today I did not backbite? We, we make sheets, alhamdulillah, Pete brothers are recording, tazkiyah, and many, for example, they don't like the sheet. They don't even re- react to the sheet. What is this work that my shaykh given to me? Extra work, I have to record my deeds. I'm one person, and as I thinks that I'm going to be judging myself based on backbiting, I can't backbite. They don't even care about this. Subhanallah. This is how much we... Have you come here to watch my face, look at my face, or my head to look at your faces? Is this what we're learning from each other? Allah Ta'ala sent you for this reason that I do my islah through Allah Ta'ala's karam, and you do your islah. But we don't care about islah, rectification, improvement. We don't care. Shaitan has showed us a dream that I am floating in the air with wings. Many people come to me, I'll tell you the truth. I said, I saw this in the dream. What did you see in the dream? I was floating and flying in the air. I said, Allah, I'll tell you the truth. I'm flying in the air. I said, where did you fly to? He said, I don't know. Then I turned and I was wandering around flying there in the world, looking at the whole world. And I saw this yesterday in the dream. I said, Allahu Akbar. I said, that even the fly, <laughs> it, it can fly and the mosquito and the bird. So what's the miracle? Made the sheet? Have you completed your sheet? Have you thought about backbiting? Have you thought about lying? About lying, the sin of lying? What hearts will we have, my brothers, that the punishment of that sin is this? And every sin creates a blot in the heart. What will be the condition of my heart? Of hearts, they will be black as coal, deep black. How will Allah's nur come into our hearts? How will fear descend into our hearts? How? All our life long, we have said and done what we want. How will nur and light come into our hearts if there's so much contamination in my heart? How will the nur enter it? 
How will the, how will it screen through the heart and get inside? Of course not. And we think that backbiting is a minor. We think it's small. What a big punishment Allah Ta'ala has defined it in the Quran. Allah says, beware. Do not, brother, speak behind the back of your other brother. Don't backbite against each other. Don't do this. And when you said, what are you doing? He said, um, that you, uh, then Jibreel Islam said that they are pulling their faces with their nails and they're eating haram food next to them. These are the words of the hadith. Allah's Nabi Islam said, that why are they like this? Because the reason for this was subhanallah, that they got used to or they didn't care in the world, they used to do this sin. So here there's nothing new for them. There the Quran told them that the deceased brother of yours, you're consuming his flesh of your real brother if you're backbiting. So if a person consumed flesh of his, of his brother in the world due to backbiting, then what will be his taste on his tongue? What will be the noor in that person's heart? What will be the condition of that person? Very negative indeed. Even if I pray 1,000 tajud, 1,000 prostrations, whatever I feel like I can do in terms of ibadah. But this is the lesson from the, for the ummah. We need to leave the sins. That's what we need to do. And this is the basis of tasawwuf and the Sufi way. That what do the walis of Allah, the sheikhs emphasize on to the students that do not sin. Do not sin. This is the emphasis. Hazrat Fazal Ali Qureshi, rahmatullah alayhi, great sheikh. And he, he, one of his khulafah, Hazrat Abdul Malik, rahmatullah alayhi. And there was Hazrat Khanka, Hazrat Fazal Ali Qureshi's Khanka. It was in the wilderness, a jungle, a river passed by. And there were different trees, different trees. And Hazrat Khanka was there. And there was a tree, a bell tree. And there was uh, like fruits on that tree. And uh, Hazrat Khalifa, as Abdul Malik, rahmatullah And very close to Hazrat Fazal Ali Qureshi. Many people would come and sit. And once he was going home, Hazrat Abdul Malik, he saw the tree. And he pulled on the tree. And he took two pieces of fruit and ate them. And Hazrat saw Kashf. And he called Hazrat Abdul Malik back, the cool Malik back. From halfway home, he was called back. He thought, oh, I'm going back, I'll get some status. And uh, he's going back with the, after doing mujahida and making effort. So Hazrat Fazal Qureshi, rahmatullahi, he, he gave him such a lesson, such a lesson. A spark was taken by that. How did you dare to do that? He said, Hazrat, this... Uh, we say normally, oh, this is a present, this is tabarruk from the Sheikh's Khanka, Hadiya, this has its gift, this is this and this. Not even one twig should we pick up without permission. Remember this. Remember this. That the fruits on one side, who has taught you that you can take this and say this Hadiya and then we'll take the bricks from the house of the teacher. He said, I owe this for due to blessings and tabarruk. What blessings? said Hazrat Fazal What blessings? This is not your property. That the sawwaf is sharia. And sharia, does it permit you that somebody's tree, you pull off the fruit and you can eat it or consume it? The who told you you can do this? That's it. Then uh, and he was a murid and this was the shaykh and he felt extreme remorse and regret and many thousands of people at Islam also due to this and he learned that this is a severe sin because he was a wali Allah, he had mushahidat experience. And this adab is shown to the awliya that this is the sin of this punishment. And he, Hazrat Fazal Krishna, knew that my murid has done this sin. And what a big azab he will get in the hereafter. Punishment. A massive punishment that will wipe away his deeds, his status. What will he do with all his status and, and rank and piety? And this sin that I'm sharing with you today, explaining. What sin was I speaking about? Say it loudly. Backbiting. Ghibat. This is such a sin that is not forgiven through tawbah. If Ramadan comes... Has it come? We're happy Ramadan's come, I'll be forgiven. Uh, you've come to dhikr, and you sat in the dhikr gathering. Do you know after dhikr, normally I've told you many times over the hadith, musnad, musnad hadith, and that as soon as a dhikr, a dhikr gathering ends, Allah announces that everyone is forgiven. So you are forgiven today on the night of Jummah. Say Alhamdulillah, Alhamdulillah. Allah Ta'ala's choice, that even the biggest of criminals, if he comes, Allah Ta'ala is the judge. It's his choice if he wants to forgive. Can anyone stop the judge, the supreme judge, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, from forgiving? Tell me. And if Allah says, I will give um, uh, the hanging, by the neck, even Bhutto was the prime minister. And he used to wander around the whole world and people knew his name. But the judge uh, gave the verdict that hanging, could anyone stop it? So what about the judge of judges? Subhanallah, the king of kings. If Allah says that today whoever comes to the gathering of Dikr on the night of Jummah, 
that this fakir is majlis, if somebody comes and does dhikr, then all of the attendees will be forgiven. Subhanallah. Subhanallah. So is this not Allah Ta'ala's karam that we've come? One person just came now, five minutes ago, he's forgiven as well, mashallah. Yes, congratulations to him, that in his destiny was forgiveness, so he came and he's forgiven. He's sitting here enjoying himself, somewhere before he must have been counting or something, but Allah's karam, Allah's mercy, whoever he gives his karam mercy to, that's fine. Allah's choice, is there anyone who can challenge Allah Ta'ala's love? It doesn't come free of charge. And some people, many that are out there who consider themselves pious and great rank, Allah stop them. You cannot go to this gathering. Not in your destiny is forgiveness. And Allah Ta'ala doesn't allow that person to come to the good. Doesn't allow. So on such points, on such actions where you get a big reward, that should we not be grateful? Should we not run to such gatherings? Of course, of course we should. We should be saved from such places. Think for a moment here. That we are sinful to such an extent that we should get such a place that for within seconds we should succeed and we should leave that place and run to the fountain of mercy. So this is what only the person who doesn't have pride will not be given forgiveness. The person who is pride in kibar, that for example the river is flowing past him and he says, oh I don't need that river, I'm pure, I'm clean, I don't need guidance. No, no, I have no need for this guidance. That person will say, big-headed, let's look towards our life. And we say, oh, we don't have time. Look, do your own thicker. Tell me, how filled with pride will that person be? And the, the Rasulullah Sallam told us about the pride of, uh, the sign of pride and imagine the punishment waiting for that person. That within this hemisphere, in such a place where things are hard or impossible, and such an amal has started that we cannot imagine such a gathering, such a majma, and only the thicker of Allah solely, purely, and who is doing this thicker of Allah? Everyone, who? Tell me. We are. Allah will give the result so that we can come and we can get forgiveness because this is the day and age of sin. We are in a bad condition. Allah Ta'ala doesn't want for the Muslim to go to Jannah. And it's written in destiny. He's got this many days left, this many breaths left. It's written, recorded. Allah says, my karam that I want to forgive you. So I create such a gathering. And what have we done? We haven't struck the arrow on the bullseye. We think, oh, I'm going to do dhikr. Will our dhikr be so great and full of effect? No, the whole universe is doing Allah's dhikr. Sabah alayhi ma fi samawati wa ma fi al-ard. Allah's king, Allah is the king, the king of kings. And the ant is doing dhikr, and the leaf is doing dhikr, and the speaker is doing dhikr, and the microphone is doing dhikr, and the copy is doing dhikr, and the ceiling is doing dhikr, and everything here is doing dhikr. There's no particle in the universe, the whole universe, to the 70 levels within the crust of the earth, within the, the ocean's levels, a small fish will be doing dhikr of Allah. What's my dhikr and your dhikr? Nothing. It's just the excuse for Allah Ta'ala's rahmah. That Allah says, recite my name for a little while with love and I will forgive these human beings who attended this gathering. doesn't matter what they've done before that. doesn't matter what they've done. Say subhanallah, subhanallah. That's it. This is the point. Look at Allah Ta'ala's rahmah. So my brothers... That such a big sin that it won't be forgiven through tawbah, backbiting. We cannot do tawbah to get the, the punishment uh, reversed. Only will this sin, the punishment be cancelled if I go and grab the ankles of the person, a backbite again. Imagine you dislike the person, you're saying bad about the person, you want to be safe from the adab, then go and put your hands on the ankles of the person that oh, I've made a big mistake. And he's telling, he's a woman. This is that same sin. For example, a woman has done zina, zina, and her tawbah, after tawbah, that zina punishment, uh, the, the sin will not be forgiven. As long as her husband does not forgive her, that I've forgiven you. Subhanallah. So, this is a, an action worse than zina. And how easy is it today? Within a second. Second. Uncle, mamu, mother, father. Everyone, we grind their name down into the dust today. After today's promise, tonight is a great night. Night of Jum'ah. We should try our best. We will try our best, inshallah. We should exclaim. Now why are we sinning openly, flagrantly? What benefit is given us? They ask, uh, for example, to speak about somebody who's a brother. Why do we need to use our tongues to speak ill? Or why do we interfere in someone's matters? If someone's good, he's good. If he's bad, he's bad. What do we have? Why do we have the need to discuss human beings and their life and their traits? That's a let's promise today. That after today, we will not open our mouths against anybody. Do we promise, my brothers? Inshallah. And one adab I've explained. What is that? One other, and the rest, subhanallah. And we're, we're drowned. Shall I tell you an amal today, an action that will be saved from all adabs, all punishments. Final point, shortcut end to the discussion. Do we make this transaction, bargain transaction? Okay, take out five pound pounds, everyone, for me. Subhanallah. So how great a solution, so easy, that today make this transaction with Allah. Bargain transaction. Exchange the agreement. 
The one sin I explained and Haji Sahib's legs are shaking, aren't they? Are they shaking? Everything's flown away. Oh, I'm stuck now. I'm stuck. What will I do? How will I go to Allah? How will I get out of this, out of, out of this um, sticky position I'm in? So there are many other sins. But there's one action that will eliminate everything. So we not do that? So we say from the adab, subhanallah, say subhanallah. Will we do this action to eliminate all the punishment? Your true promise, put your hands up if you're going to implement this action. Subhanallah, mashallah. Is it agreed? Okay, fine, put your hands down. Right, so there's a hadith narrated in Bayhaqi. And this hadith states that the person, there's no action to save anyone from the punishments. No action better than the dhikr of Allah. Should we not come to the dhikr of Allah? Okay, now let's see next. I tell you another statement, hadith. That Allah's adab, the punishments Allah gives out, there's no action better, easier, greater than dhikr of Allah that will save anyone from the punishment that Allah will give. So this is proven, Allah is saying that I've given you such a solution. If you grab that solution, inshallah, you will not even commit the sins in the first place, subhanallah. Because a person sins from the heart. And a person who starts doing dhikr of Allah, then his heart is full of nur and dirt cannot reach to that heart. Subhanallah. And Allah says, you have to do as I am saying to you. Ya ayyuhalladheena amnudhkurullah dhikran kathira wa sabihu bukratan wa asila. Yes, uh, we live in America. Allah, it's hard for me to do dhikr kathira. How can I do dhikr morning and evening? I live in America or England. I'm going, I am going to Bolton. I've gone here and there. Allah says, you make the niyyah and it's my task to make you implement the action. Allah, I live in Bolton, Zakaria Masjid, and there's no dhikr, etc. Allah says, you make niya, in Zakaria Masjid, the dhikr will arrive. Allah, my house is near Makki Masjid, Allah says, go to Makki Masjid, the dhikr will happen there. Allah, I live near Al-Fala, you go to Al-Fala, the dhikr will come there. Subhanallah. So Al-Fala is too far. I live in an area, there's no masjid where I am, there are no masjids, how will I come there? I'm ill. How will I attend dhikr? Allah says, I'll make taqwa masjid, Subhanallah. Subhanallah. Okay, fair enough, you got these masjids, but Allah, I'm very far away. Oh, lock stock further than that, there's a place and there's a doctor of ours who lives there. And Allah says, I'll make masjid Aisha there. Subhanallah. So should we do the or not? The who is Allah given this ease to? Tell me. The truth. Straightforward discussion of everything. I'm not giving a speech. No dialogue. No lecture. So how foolish and mad we are, human beings. There's no one more jahil and ignorant than us. That if we just analyze and do our accounts on this, that do we want to be safe from adab? Then put your hands up. How many brothers come to the dhikr gatherings? How many people come in the morning? How many brothers come in the morning? And how many came to Al-Falah Masjid the other day? How many will be in Masjid Taqwa tomorrow? And the day after in uh, Masjid Aisha, how many people will come? Allah's Fazal, I will run. I, will, uh, I won't be here. Maybe on Sunday I go somewhere else. So there's a different program. Tell me. So will Allah Ta'ala not ask that in the fire of hell when we'll be burning and we'll be drowning in the adab, Allah will say, Oh my creation, where were you at that time? What excuse do you have? That in that uh, place that you're in, the, the bad environment, and I gave you dhikr of Allah. So easy to perform dhikr, a pure dhikr. And such a peer who doesn't take, he gives, he just gives and he just gives. Tell me. Such a peer I said to you, they will never take from you anything. He'll keep on giving to you the good solutions, and he will have no greed, no desire, no fikr, no want, and he doesn't even care about himself. Khalis, pure, he will do that action. The work of the Nabi, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa And even then you don't do the dhikr of Allah, Allah says, that take your defects out, Allah says, say subhanallah. That Allah says, take your nooks out. Why don't you come to dhikr? That take out the nooks, what is the defect? What's the reason I don't go to this gathering? I don't like this, or I don't want this, or this is good. What's happened? What's happened? Give a pure a proof that takes some defect out of that person. That Allah Ta'ala sent that individual to the world, that he has spread dhikr across the whole world with the fadl of Allah. With the grace of Allah, his sheikh, who sat on the dust, on the sand, in a mud hut, in a small place in Ghadai Sharif, he raised his head and said, go and teach dhikr and spread it across the world. So Allah Ta'ala's hukam, the dhikr has spread. Whose dunya is this? Allah's. Allah wants everything to spread. So either take the defect out of the sheikh, who goes to all these localities and teaches the dhikr. This dhikr is from that, or this sitting down doing this. Even today I heard, as a Maulana, uh, Taqi Madda Zalali said an ajeeb and unique thing I'm quite surprised he stated that dhikr majalis gathering was of dhikr of Abu Aqabrin who did dhikr that there is no limit to this there's no principle of these gatherings underlying principle 
There's no, you don't need proof from the hadith to sit in the gathering of dhikr for tazkiyah. The methodology for tazkiyah, every shaykh has utilized his methods for the tarbiyah of his murids and he, he has taken hold of that process. Sometimes it's performed tazkiyah in this way and sometimes in another way. He said himself, he gave the example himself, such a great person whose reference I'm giving to you. He said that when I uh, was, for example, in the chishti as order of the sheikhs, they would sit and both ankles and their toes, they would press them after pressing their toes, then passing their hands over their feet, then they'd give the tariqah that how they would, for example, prevent their feet from moving. Then after that, they would suppress their desires and their nafs and do the islah. Has anyone got any proof of this from the hadith, this method to have? Why is this bidah then? Why do we say this is bidah? So in reality, the point here is this, that shows such an action. Now Allah Ta'ala said, do dhikr. Allah says, do it openly, openly, freely. So Allah Ta'ala has not put any pre-restriction on the action of dhikr, for the sake of dhikr. And the mashayik al-karam, the respected mashayik and the walis, they have with their standard and their method, have taught their students what is islah, tazkiyah. So here for example, there's a speaker here, isn't it? Yep. And then the time of Rasulullah was their speaker. So then how did the word get um, communicated and spread out far wide? Uh, for example, you're listening here. And in the whole world, the people in the world are listening through this. Is this bidah? So as time passes, as the generations progress, the foundation point is the same. But Allah Ta'ala says the effect or the physical form for tabliq can change. And Allah says according to the need of the society, Allah Ta'ala sends mushayikh in those localities to reform the human beings. Do you understand? Yes. So I ask the same question, what's happened to us people? Such a great lesson today. That do we have any other solution or potion or magic potion? Allah says, do dhikr the way I have prescribed to us, Allah said. Allah says, do dhikr kathira. What is dhikr kathira? Dhikr in the heart. So do you not get this from here or not? Tell me. You get dhikr kathira, dhikr in the heart, then why don't we do dhikr of the heart? So why do we run away? Number two. And then... Allah says, do dhikr kathira. And Allah says, do it morning and evening. Allah says, Allah not pre- uh, prepared morning and evening. Alhamdulillah, alhamdulillah, alhamdulillah. Praise be to Allah. Allah's thousands, hundreds of thousands, millions of times over shukr that we have not left any morning dhikr up to now. Subhanallah. Subhan. Then, then, so who will we blame on the day of judgment? We live our lives and sleep like donkeys and speak nonsense that don't feel like it or make excuses. We are challenging Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Tell me, that has Allah ta'ala put any restriction on dhikr? That this is the restriction, this is the reason why you shouldn't come. There's no restriction on the amount of dhikr to do. Subhanallah. No, it's from our own limits. We speak nonsense and rubbish and put an upper limit on it. Then how will we be safe from the adab? That Allah has told us, that whatever you do, whatever there is, at least sit in the dhikr of Allah has promised that I will save you from adab. So he knows, Allah knows better, and Allah knows that how through dhikr, how Allah that will take the, for example, the love of dunya of our lives and speaking nonsense, bone idol talk, ghibat. Allah will eliminate these sins from our lives if we do dhikr. We don't know the effect. Allah knows the effect. Our job is to start doing dhikr. And I know that I will be presented in the court of Allah. I say to myself, Allah, I say, Allah, you promised to me. You promised that if I keep on doing dhikr, then you will prov- you will save me from adab. So why Allah, you show me adab. Allah have yaqeen in Allah. Allah will say, you are honest, you are truthful. Go to Jannah, go to paradise. Subhanallah. Whatever I did, you continue to do. Subhanallah. And the rest is my job to save you. I promise to you, Allah Ta'ala says. So brothers, look at this, how great a point. Will we do the good? Inshallah. The, mas- in the masjid in the morning should be full of, of that kirin, isn't it? We're going to pass away. And there's no bigger idol than this. Or either we sit down numb and forget about everything and, and await the punishment. So this is not a speech. This is not a lecture. I was just touching on the hearts of the brethren, on our lifestyle, on our destinies, on our thinking. This is the difference in this discussion. This is the difference in this majlis. Every point should go and pierce your hearts and all of our hearts. Because Allah Ta'ala wants to save us. That's it. So Allah Ta'ala has opened a path. Do the dhikr of Allah. Allah says, remember me and I'll save you from the adab, from punishments. That's it. We stood there. We said, Allah, what you said, we've done. And Allah says, I will save you from the punishment from the adab. Allah, we can see we're on the bank of Jannah. Please show us the way out. Show us the way out. Allah will say, no problem. Fine. Then we see hadith that justify this point. May Allah Ta'ala give us all the capability and capacity and tawfiq wherever we head. Look, it's so easy for us, subhanAllah. 
The haq should be this, that brothers, for example, for us, it looks like a mountain. Then, for example, if even dhikr is being done on the top of Mount Everest, we should reach there. This is the haq. We shouldn't be afraid of adab or severity. And we're in Bolton, how will we go there? Oh, it's just a 15 minute drive, 10 minute drive to dhikr. The nice car, time is suitable. We have the whole system. What's the reason we don't do dhikr? Nothing. There's no reason. We just don't do it. Just shaitan advising us. So this is the adab of doing the wrong actions. So my brothers, let's not be negligent and lazy from today. Make a time table of life of the day that now I'm going to do this action. Dhikr is on this day in this location. Dhikr on the next day in this location. Do dhikr with happiness and openly. And say to Allah, Allah, I am weak. I'm weak and the dunya today is very weak. And I'm wrapped by dunya. But Allah, your shukr, I'm grateful to you. You've given me such a bathing place. That every majlis, morning and evening. Morning and evening. Morning and evening, we, if we go to every majlis, then how many majlises does that make in a week? Tell me my brothers, I don't know how to count. How many? Count it. In one day there are two, so in seven days there are 14. 14. So Allah Rabbul Alameen has promised that through the 14 gatherings you've visited of dhikr, I'll forgive you in all 14. So if a person morning and evening gets forgiveness, 14 times in the week you'll get forgiveness. And such nights he will pass through, which are beautiful, full of noor and effect. Is this a small gift? What do we need to do? Nothing at all. And dhikr, you get enjoyment and taste. Don't you feel enjoyment when you do dhikr of Allah? Yes? So imagine, compare the taste before and after. And mashallah, see there are many people here, isn't it? Who are here, who appreciate this. Mashallah, this is the karam of Allah, the mercy of Allah. What preparation Allah has made? That not that Allah Ta'ala doesn't look at your sinful and send you such a person. So Allah Ta'ala says, you'll forget the music that you listen to. You'll forget, there'll be a tune and he will make you must and he'll make you enjoy it. So a person forgets all music. Every single thing is taught with every kalima, the beautiful melody of the, the, the dhikr that we perform. And every day it changes. The Allah Ta'ala gives a mood and then that uh, style comes out in the dhikr. Subhanallah. So what else do we want? What else do we need? So will we come from now on? There can never be better preparation this to save ourselves from uh, punishment. There's so much music today. People love music, isn't it? Allah says, hey, look here. I'll give you the alternative solution. Do the dhikr of Allah. Recite the rushi with such a melody it comes out. Doesn't it? Comes with a beautiful melody. Rhythmic. Everything Allah Ta'ala completes nice for us. But we don't want to be human beings, good human beings. We want to stay as monkeys and burn. After today, don't be lazy, my friends. Everyone has to arrive to the gatherings of dhikr that are happening during the week. And consider this your good fortune and destiny. And write this down. That in every way, I have to 14 times a week get forgiveness from Allah. Somebody will be forgiven in the morning. And during the day, he will commit many sins, possibly. In six hours, he will commit many sins. Six hours, seven hours. We shouldn't lose it. Husband Allah, one name al-wakil. That's it. Then forgiveness again in the evening. And then we'll go and sleep in the night. How many sins will we do? In the morning, we'll get up. Allah will give forgiveness again. And they will say, we didn't live in Bolton, we are women, we were in different places. Allah will say, don't worry, such preparation that to your homes the volume, the announcement will come. Is it not going? And women are mashallah students and they'll have forgiveness as well. And those brothers who live in London, they're included. Those who are in Bradford, they're included. Black men, they're also included. Everyone gets the same thawab. So look at Allah's glory and shan. That's such a great reward for dhikr. And Allah says, I've given it to you in the dunya. Thousands of men and women are listening at this moment time. Somewhere 2 a.m., somewhere it's 3 a.m., somewhere it's 5 hours difference, somewhere 6 hours difference. Someone's ahead, someone's behind, so America's behind. Everyone in the dunya at this moment of time is listening. When I go, then it starts, texts come. More communication. I heard this today, I heard your bayan. And Islam, I did my rectification. All night long, this fakir's work, morning and evening, continues to run. Subhanallah. That I have this intention that this hadith, I think sometimes I'm sat in Jannah, morning and evening, the work of the deen. So beautiful, subhanAllah. So brothers, make life like this. So at least we realize, why are we living like dead people? Money, 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 four, five. We're just running around. Don't we uh, get tired of counting money? At least wash your hands with the soap sometime. And get pure. That's it. This is enough. This is enough. I've counted so much money. I've opened a chat that till so much. At least be content at some stage. Anyway, let's recite. Do Ruchrif Mela Tala give the Tawfiq Amin.